Greetings, programs and users. It is time once again for another episode of Old Nerds Drinking. I am John Patrick, the Master Control Program, and here with me again in the studio is... Uh, hi, folks. This is Rojan. What's up? How's it going? <laughs> I'm sorry. There have been other people sitting at the desk. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We could say that this this looks um, unkempt would be a, a word that comes to mind. Well, I, I was I was also like putting bases on like twenty miniatures. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I see that. Yeah, but uh, together again, once again, we are old nerds and we are drinking, and boy, are we drinking! So today, we are drinking natural light black cherry lemonade flavored vodka. The same people that brought us the Natty Ice Dirty 30 uh, have now brought you vodka. And this is black cherry lemonade flavored. This looks like sadness. This is 30% alcohol by volume, four times distilled, 60 proof. Um, nothing screams bitch drink more than this. Like, this is something I would expect to see at a sorority party. Oh, um, oh yes. This is this is the kind of alcoholic beverage that terrible high school decisions are made on. I happen to I have no shame here. I happen to enjoy these kinds of drinks. But um, are you a connoisseur of the Boone's Farm Arbor Mist? I am a yes, yes, and Arbor Mist. Yes, I do enjoy the Arbor Mist. Boone's Farm, not so much. I um, mean, it, I can slam a whole bottle of Boone's Farm and get nothing off of it. But that just could be because I'm a fat ass and right. Body weight ratio to alcohol, etc. Like it's not enough that it's not the same natty ice that makes the beer, and and it's not enough that it's vodka. But it's also the the cheerful pink flamingos. On oh, they it. embrace it. They know exactly oh, yeah. what they're doing yeah. here, and I'll give them points for that. They're not trying to hide it at all. They know their target audience. They're going for that target audience, and they have no shame about going after that audience with what it looks like. Uh, natural light has been there for the good times in America since 1977. Now we're changing the game by introducing natural light flavored vodka for those who like black cherry lemonade and drinking vodka and poor decisions and poor decisions. Uh, enjoy as a chilled shot or mixed with club soda. Uh, <laughs> Which if we've done neither. <laughs> oh, oh my God. Dear members of the OND, OND nation. Questions and comments, call 1 800 342 5283. We should call that number on the air. Oh my God, we're going to have to at some point. So We should call that number on the air. So uh, we are both, uh, we're both here with the shot glasses. We're going right. to do a shot real quick. Clink. Clink. Um, oh yeah, uh, shout out to, um, I guess we need uh, Gilbert Godfrey. Yeah, we got to so. pour one out for uh, Gilbert. So, uh, yep. Gilbert, this one's for you. This is for you, Gilbert Godfrey. <laughs> okay. Mmm. Subtle notes of, of, of Gatorade. And rubbing alcohol. Just a hint of ball sweat. Um, <laughs> um, oh, that was... You know, as far as flavored vodkas go, I'm not a big fan of them anyways. This one is sweet. It can be drinking straight or drank straight. Um, so you did not want to opt for this. I did actually do pour an ounce and a half into a, a rock glass with club soda. Yeah. I could see it being good with club soda. I taste club soda. Might have needed a little bit more of the vodka in it. This would probably go good with the Walmart cherry lime limeade waters that me and you are fond of drinking. Yeah. Or something like that. This this would be good mixed with something. Um, oh, you know what? Because in addition to this, they also have like just a straight lemonade. I went for this because, you know... This, no, this isn't bad. It's, this, it's this, really not bad. This I mean, bottle's a winner. Um, as, as far as Miss Bitch Drinks... I mean, this this would be something that you would bring when you have a chick over to the house. And I, I have... A, me, and my, me and a friend of mine have a, a joke about, like, what would be the good... What would be a good, low-budget, cheap date when you're sitting around just watching movies? And I think we agreed that Pizza Hut... With the breadsticks and, you know, and I, I said Arbor Mist peach wine. Um, if I really wanted to get laid, I would probably bring that. This this cherry, you know, black cherry. This would, this would, this would be the quicker route. I was going to say, it's, uh, oh man, what were those? 
I remember I've heard tell of the drink, the pink panty dropper, but I don't remember what's in it. This would yeah, this would qualify in this pink panty dropper. It, it is very pink. This would be something that I would drink uh, during my bad movie nights on on Cinema the Bad, where we watch really shitty movies. This would be something that I would drink during one of those sessions. Um, I, I, you know, it's okay. You know, I would drink it again. I would drink it with. I would drink it with something. I don't know if I could drink it straight. Yeah, I, um, it, I think maybe it's only thirty percent alcohol by volume. Um, yeah, I did a an ounce and a half in a rock glass with ice and club soda. I think I would probably maybe dare to go half and half. But this does remind me a lot of the uh, the Burdette or Burnett uh, sweet tea vodka. Which it does. That yeah. stuff is dangerous. You got to cut that stuff because you'll drink it straight and not realize you're drinking vodka. Um, and I could definitely see that. It does, like I said, it has that vodka y uh, rubbing alcohol aftertaste. But then again, you're shoot. We were doing shots, so you're just getting that. Actually, this would be something that I would drink because I'm I'm turning fifty soon. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm becoming. I will be officially become an old man here soon. And this would be something that I would drink at my super soft birthday party. <laughs> oh, you're gonna have a super soft birthday party, are you? I'm gonna plan. I'm. I, I've been told that I'm going to. One of my friends is planning on hosting a super soft birthday party for me, and this oh. would be something that would be good at that. Party. Oh my god! There, there was a TikTok I was following for a while, and it was a guy who was doing Baron von Strahd from Ravenloft, as if he was Shorzy from <laughs> Letter Kenny. Letter Kenny, and it was amazing. <laughs> Letter Kenny is absolutely my favorite show. I'm pretty I'm pretty late to the Letter Kenny party. I only I was too. I was uh, too. Mid COVID, I think I started like just dipping my toes in it and then uh earlier this year, like right around Christmas, I think I went on a full on binge when I had the flu. Um yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's I think that's when I started when I had COVID the second time over the over Christmas. Is uh I think that was what began the Letter Kenny trip. I, I have a friend out there that that watches a lot of shows with me, and I know they're going to hear this and be like, no, 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 it was this time. But, yeah, I, I fell into the Letter Kenny thing really hard, and uh, so much so that I actually have a Letter Kenny Shamrocks jersey. It doesn't quite fit oh. me properly, though. I have a hockey jersey as well. And uh, I'm anxiously waiting the next season to pop out. I'm also waiting for the Shorzy show, show to be Oh, dude, that's going to so, be amazing. I'm curious about the Shorzy show, though. Right. I mean, they showed him. They, well, we all knew who Shorzy actually was, you know, if you're if you're a fan of Letter Kenny. And then in the last episode of the last season of Letterkenny, they finally showed Shorzy next to the sign. They actually showed his face. And we all knew who it was, but I'm, I'm curious how, like, I'm wondering where that story is going to go and how it's going to be done, you know? But if you're not a Letterkenny fan and you haven't watched the show yet, it's basically re uh, Canadian rednecks, for lack of a better term. It took me halfway through the first season to realize they were in Canada. Yeah, it, well, they, there's little subtle terms here and there. They drop and things that you pick up on or whatever. But see, this is weird thing. Like I, for the longest time, I always envisioned rednecks being a strictly American thing, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize that the concept of of rednecks outside of America. You know, because in America, pickup trucks, you know, guns and blah 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 and Budweiser, the whole, everything that goes along with being a redneck. That doesn't seem like it would work in another country. But Letter Kinney, it does. They're still rednecks. They even talk about it on the show about how they are rednecks. Right. And they just drink puppers, but they all drink. They all drive pickup trucks, and it's like they're they're uh, rednecks, but they're just super polite rednecks. They are. Um, and then I've got friends in Australia. They're like, "Yeah, we've got rednecks here." And then they showed me what Australian rednecks <laughs> were, and I began to re realize that yes, every country does have its rednecks, even UK, Britain, and so forth. British rednecks are kind of weird. They don't quite like Canadian rednecks, Australian rednecks, and stuff like like the concept of a French redneck doesn't. How is there? You know, how does a French redneck work? You know, I don't. I don't quite get it. Um, <laughs> but you know, I'm sure it exists. Okay, so French rednecks are. 100% soccer fans. Um, they are rural areas. They're not the people who live in the cities. And they will fucking drink you under the table. Like, I've watched episodes of No Reservations and Anthony Bourdain's show uh, Parts Unknown where he goes to France. And if you get outside of, like, Paris, France, like in the very rural countries... They get real redneck real fast. I'd be curious to see what that would be. There's just you a know. lot more like 
dri- like binge drinking fancy wines and like fancy cheeses. But yeah, they're still rednecks. Fancy wines and cheeses. I'd have to see it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, yeah. I you know, I guess every country has their own flair on it. Like with Letter Kenny, it's it's like in America, you know, gays are bad. You know, you know, spits their two inch tobacco. But up in Canada, like they could care less about a person's sexuality and what they are or whatever. Right, right. You know, which is it's it's different. You know, <laughs> compared to when you come from America. You know, but um. Anyways, yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to the next season of Letterkenny, and uh, which they should be starting up pretty soon. That ensures because right now Letterkenny's touring America with their live show, which is like eighty five dollars a ticket or something like that. I don't know about that, man. I don't know, I, dude. I I was so sad because uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was doing a lecture or like an evening at uh, the Fillmore, and I was like, dude, that would be so cool to go see. Like the cheap seats were a hundred and twenty five dollars. Yeah. And yeah, that that's that's more than I'm willing to spend. I just paid seventy five for concert tickets to go see to buy tickets for Pussifer and then I'm gonna be buying some tickets for High Long in the fall. And even those ones aren't that expensive. Dude, I'm so. I'm getting tickets for Sabaton at the Fillmore and it's like fifty bucks to sit in the loge, which is mm-hmm. the lower mezzanine. But like standing room tickets are only like thirty two dollars. Uh, I'm just too damn old to be standing for a concert for two and a half hours. You know, you may you may at the side of the show, which is fine. But um, the last concert I went to, one of my favorite bands is called All Them Witches. And I went and saw them at a place called The Magic Stick in Detroit. And it has been a long, 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 long time, probably since I was in my early 20s, since I went and saw a, a band that I really like in a small venue with less than 400 people. And the tickets weren't horribly expensive, but it was really cool when I got there and I'm watching this band. I'm like, this is pretty cool because if I wanted to, I could walk right up to the stage, put my arms on the stage and be right up in front of the band if I really wanted to. You know, and I'm not a million miles away because before that I went and saw Tool. And of course, you know, that's at uh, Little Caesars Arena in Detroit and it was really far back. But it was just neat to go and see a a band in a really small, intimate environment that you're really into and not have to worry about seeing them from like nine miles away yeah, or you yeah, know, something like, like that. Uh I I went and saw the only concert I've seen in like a big like stadium arena was Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yeah, but that that's different because that, they're yeah. so massive of a sound. Yeah, I was gonna say you know. that's less of a I mean to put it this way, there's not one band. There's like two bands. There's an East Coast band and a West Coast band. Yeah. They're interchangeable. It's the music. Yeah. Um, and it's just a stage show. But like, I see these people going to see the Rolling Stones, and it's like, man, I don't want to see 70 year old Mick Jagger dancing around the stage. He can't even hit the like notes of some of the old you songs. You know what, though? I mean,. But, but I, I get why people would do it though if that's your thing, you know. I, I'm not like I, I went and saw Pink Floyd on their last tour at, at the at, at the bygone Pontiac Silverdome, and I was literally in the last row in the upper deck, and we paid $135 for tickets, and that was way back in the 90s. And I mean, it it was cool because they had such a massive show. But I was, I mean, I would, I I couldn't be any more nosebleed section. The wall to the the wall to the stadium was behind us. And I was just like, I mean, that was that that was the most I've ever paid for a ticket, and the furthest back I've ever been from a band. Um, I'm glad I went because I was I could say, yeah, I went and saw Pink Floyd. But still, man, I was like, I don't know if I would the, ever do that only, again. There's only two of those concerts that I would actually pay to go see at like a stadium, um, and that would be either Elton John or Billy Joel. Wow, those are two bands that I two two names that I did not expect to come out of your mouth. Oh yeah, totally. Wow. Okay. Uh, Elton John, maybe Billy Joel. Nah. Oh, nah. dude, I I I unabashedly love like the entire body of Billy Joel's career, like from doo-wop Billy Joel to like eighties, like we didn't start the fire and kind of getting political Billy Joel to nineties uh, River of Dreams Billy Joel. Oh yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, not my thing, but I'm not going to belittle you for it. <laughs> nope. Because, um, like I said, no shame whatsoever. Yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, if you're going to own it, own it and be proud about it. Mm-hmm. So um, where do you want to start on this? you want to start at Moon Knight? I think we should start at Moon Knight because we were talking about uh, TV at first with Letterkenny. So yeah. um, you have been, like, so jonesed about Moon Knight. Oh, I love Moon Knight. I yeah, always I know. have. I know, I know. So, like, Me we and are... Banjo Jones are huge Moon Knight fans. Yeah. 
Um, I will admit, even though Midnight or Moon Knight is associated with the Midnight Suns, like which was one of like my big Marvel things, I really never followed Moon Knight. I, I mean, like this this TV show is kind of my first real stepping my stepping into the Moon Knight genre. I don't want to say genre, but stepping into the Moon Knight. It's a very different comic book, even in a character, even for Marvel. I'm, 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 I'll, um, I'll just say it right now. The most I know of Moon Knight is the meme where he's busting down and he's like, Dracula, you, come out, you nerd. You still owe me 20 bucks. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> I remember that And one. all I want out of this show is to understand why Dracula owes Moon Knight $20. You're not going to get that in this show. Damn it. Um, Moon Knight was this really... He's a really off the wall, quirky character, and he's got a really strange place within the Marvel pantheon of characters. And uh, I think I liked him because he was so off the wall. Like he would usually, like you'd probably at most see him team up with like uh, Daredevil or Spider Man. He was one of those lower level, off the wall right. street characters. Uh, but he was also very much involved into the supernatural, the spiritual realm of things. But the thing that made Moon Knight so spectacular and so different was the fact that he had all of these alternate personalities so you were never entirely sure of which moon knight you were going to get and what state of mind he was going to be in um the show is a little bit different but it does a really good job of capturing that flavor of of the duality of what moon knight is Mm -hmm. And um, they've addressed, in in the comic book, he had, I think it was three personalities, and later on he actually had more. He just kept developing all these alternate personalities that he was constantly at war with. And for a while, when I quit reading the comic book, he had actually gotten to a point where he was like, okay, we're all going to have to learn to live together if we're all going to be here. And uh, there's signs of that coming in the television show. You haven't seen the last episode at this point. No, I I just... I don't want to ruin it. But, um... The show handles it really, really well. And the thing, one of the things I like about the show so much is that when they decided to do this, for one, I was like, there's no way they're ever going to make Moon Knight into a television series. And then there was rumblings about it. And I was like, oh, my God, it might actually happen. It might actually happen. And then when it did happen, of course, I was super, super stoked. Um, but one of the things I really like about it is that they actually brought in mental health consultants to make sure that they were portraying the whole aspect of multiple personality disorder how it affects people and what it does to be accurate and non-insulting. Um, I guess that's the best the best way I could possibly put it. And it flows very well. The show is written very well. And one of the things that I like about it also is that it doesn't. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um, I don't know. I don't call it debate or whatever. But it, you don't have to go out and watch all of the other Marvel movies or shows to have to watch Moon Knight. It is kind of a standalone kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And if it were on Netflix or something, I could see where people are like, well, does this tie into the regular Marvel world? And of course it does. It's on It's on Disney+. Plus. Right. So, you know, you know it, it, Marvel's making it, so you know it ties into the Disney, into the rest of the Marvel universe. But they don't have to, they don't, there's no need for them to tie it into the rest of the universe. There's no need to have to, like, we have to have something Captain America in the background. Yeah, you know what, I, like I, I will say that, because it, it starts out in London, and it's it's like you don't hear people talking about, like, oh, yeah, remember when the Chitauri attacked, like, a few yeah. years ago, where they just, they're just they just saying it to say that they have to tie it yeah. in? Like, there's really no touching on anybody else in the Marvel Universe. I don't even think they've mentioned anybody else in the Marvel Universe I know Universe if they yet. have it. There's, there's lots of little subtle nods to things in the background, but you really have to pay attention to them. But I rather enjoy the fact that they're not bound by having to mention that. I was talking to a friend of mine, and they were talking about thinking about watching it, and I'm like, well, it's, it's a great show to watch because if, you ha- if you're not into the Marvel stuff, you don't have to be to watch this show. You know, they're, they're going to tie it in later on down the road, I'm assuming. Here's the problem with it, though, is that Oscar Isaac only has a contract for this series of shows. He's not under, I think he's coming back for the Halloween special, which is the Marvel Werewolf uh, Halloween show, which is Werewolf by Night number 32 is actually where, and they actually did a nice little nod, nod to this in the, probably the last episode that you watched. On the top of a bus, it was... Uh, uh, D- w the top of the bus that they showed said WBN zero three two, and I caught it. Of course, my my wife who watches it with me, she didn't catch it. I didn't want to go totally nerding out on her. But he's supposed to come back for the um, Marvel Halloween special, which is supposed to be a werewolf one. So they're kind of tying it all together real nicely there. But after that, um, he's not 
contracted to Marvel or not. And from what I understand, that was because of what happened with Star Wars. He didn't know if he wanted to work with, you know, how, he didn't know if he wanted to be tied into something with Marvel Disney after the whole Star Wars fiasco. Yeah, because, so. yeah, the, well, we, we won't get into that argument. No, no, again. we're not going to get into it, but, and I'm not looking to. But um, from what I understand, though, Marvel and Star Wars are two separate entities that are handled completely differently within the... Yeah, they're, um, they're managed by different creative yeah. teams. Yeah. And I think, um, from what I understand, it looks like that they've treated him well because he's been doing a lot of press junkets and stuff for it. And if I was noticing in the credits that he is actually one of the executive, Oscar Isaac is one of the executive producers of the show. So I don't know if that was um, something that was one of his conditions for coming on the show or what have you or or something like that. But uh, that was surprising. I wasn't expecting to see Oscar Isaac as an executive producer of it. Um, what exactly he exactly executive produced and what he did on the show, I'm not really sure, but I don't really care because so far it's been a great quality series, and I I I would put it up there with, and and not in any particular order. Um, I would be WandaVision, Loki, and probably Moon Knight, so far as my top favorites that they've done with the Marvel Universe um, mm-hmm. shows that have been on Disney Plus. Not necessarily in that order, but you know all three of those shows have been really solid shows so far. And the writing on this show is very smart. The special effects are good. The budget's good. Moon Knight looks good, even when he converts to the other character, which is Mr. Knight. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of... I, I want to see what happens and where these characters go. Like, I, I know what Moon Knight is, but, like, what are they going to do with Mr. Knight? Like, how is he going to fit as a superhero? You right, know? <laughs> right. So, yeah, I love it. I, I, I've got no complaints about the show at all. I think it's fantastic, and I, I, I'm looking forward to more... I I am impressed by how fucking creepy Ethan Hawke is as the villain. Absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah. It, 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 like, re- oh, man. You his know. deadpan, de- well, I don't say deadpan, but his calm demeanor and what he puts out, just the creepiness that he exudes. Right, right. Because I was like, Ethan Hawke, well... All right, I, you know, sure, whatever, you know. In Marvel, we trust. Let's let's see where this goes. I don't know why, but for some reason, Ethan Hawke in my mind is like always. I have to remind myself, like, like I, in my mind, him and the lead singer of Sugar Ray are the same person because they both have that very kind of close to the same face. And the spiky hair that they both had, like it, Guy Ferrari, Ferrari, whatever the hell, yeah, but yeah, yeah, not not Nathan, not 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 no, not no. <laughs> like like okay. I said, it's just this weird thing I have. Because um, now I'm gonna look and be like, let's go to Flavor Town. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's great. He's a great. He's a great villain. Um, the, the oh, that's whole, right. You haven't seen the last one, so we can't yeah, talk about but it. But like the whole chase scene they did, where I, I don't know if they were in France or Switzerland, and he's in the cupcake truck, and it's sh- like it's still from the Stephen character's point of view, mm-hmm. where he will just blank out for a moment, and then he's standing around a, a ring of bodies, and he doesn't know what's going on, but it's to show that there's the loss of time where he's switching to the the Mark personality. The Mark personality is in control, and you don't know what's going on yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was really interesting cinematography on that. See, again, I knew what was going on, and the wife had no idea. And it was really hard for me to... I didn't want to spoil it for her, because she's never seen... She has no idea who Moon Knight is. She doesn't know anything about it. Mm-hmm. And she didn't understand the whole multiple personality concept or anything like that. And I was just like, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, because... It's it's best enjoyed by... It's actually better if you don't know what's going on going into it with any pre-expectations or anything. I feel a little bummed that I knew going into it, oh, yeah, that's that's because of this or that's because of that. Whereas my wife has no idea, and she really enjoys it because she's like, what's going on here? You know, she's trying to piece it together. Ooh. So oh. so th- this ties into a, a, a intellectual argument that I was talking about with some friends the other day. If you could have one piece of media erased from your memory so you could rewatch it with fresh eyes like like your favorite thing and you could just re-experience it with for the first time without ever having seen it before or known anything about it what would you do that's a toss-up between two movies and i can't equally decide which one i would go with and they both immediately come to mind the first one 
Well, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll say one of them because the other one we're going to be leading into at some point uh, down the road. The first one would probably be Blade Runner because Blade Runner is absolutely one of my favorite movies ever. Um, okay, okay. Now, tying to that, because there's so many different versions of Blade Runner, what any would be of them? the... Yeah. Any of them, really. Any of them. Um, the other one would probably be Dune. Um, if I could forget completely the other renditions of Dune that came before it and just see the last rendition of Dune, because, again, my wife saw that with me, and... Again, it's another situation where I'm sitting there and trying not to talk and ruin the movie because I know so much about it. And, you know, seeing that with fresh eyes and having no idea what's going on, that would be one of those movies. And I would say Fight Club also in there somewhere because Fight Club is another one of my favorite movies. But that would be at the bottom of the list. So those would be my top three that I would I would probably go back to. Uh, as far as which one, if it would be Blade Runner or Dune, if I had to choose... I would probably say Dune simply because Blade Runner is dated at this point, whereas the newest yeah. version of Dune, in my opinion, is the most superior version of Dune that I have seen. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. So that yeah, I'd, I'd go with that. I, I, if I had if I had to choose, I would say probably Dune. You know, as weird as this is to say, I think it would be the first Matrix. Like I, I was so. Like, still to this day, the the first Matrix, when I saw it, was one of the the very, very, very few movies I've ever seen where the trailers hadn't given away the movie. Like, you went to the movie, and the plot twist came into the movies, and you were, like, blown away. Like I can respect that. And it's just, like, being able to experience that again. I can respect, because the Matrix, Matrix changed a lot. Of, it changed how cinema was made. And it had such an original story behind it, mm -hmm. the the concept, and, and plus it like there's a lot of people that I read, and like, it, it it borrowed a lot from a, like Philip K. Dick. It, Philip K. Dick had actually, in one of his press conferences, had s described the Matrix. He was talking about in Philip K. Dick said, "I believe that we are all living in a computer simulation," and blah blah blah. And of course, Philip K. Dick was probably out of his mind on methamphetamine at the time during the interview. Well, he was also a paranoid delusion. Exactly. Also. Exactly. Um, so, you know, and the, which, and the Wachowskis never denied any of this stuff. They're like, no. yeah, we borrowed from all of this stuff to make the movie, which is another reason why I really respected them. They never tried to hide that they did what they did. And I was like, oh, okay. So they're like, yeah, we're paying an, a, a homage to it. <laughs> but the Matrix, the, oh, the way okay. it was no, filmed. No, 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 we, we gotta, we gotta stop this right now. The word is homage. Whatever. It okay, is not homage. homage. They, were, they were paying homage to it. Or homage. Oh yeah. Okay. It, it's like, I had a... I took a film history class in college, and this was, like, one of the things that my professor harped on. He's like, if you ever hear anybody pronounce homage any other way, it is just because they want to sound like a pretentious douchebag. I, I'm not trying to sound pretentious. I legitimately mean an idiot. <laughs> but anyways... Um... Ladies and gentlemen, I, that was the equivalent of getting of getting bitch smacked by Will Smith at the Oscars. So, oh, anyways, um, God, yeah, I don't give a fuck about that at all. But, anyways, um, I, I, I have pleasantly forgotten the Oscars existed, and then this made me remember that the Oscars existed, and it just made me mad again. But we'll get there. Hold on. But the Matrix, the way it was filmed, the storyline that it told, um, the concepts behind it. Um, because it changed in a bullet time, the way bullet time was made, oh, dude. everybody copied it, it was well, like Star Wars. I was going to say, and it, it pushed special effects so far forward that when they made the sequel, they had nowhere else to go. Yes. They, 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 they had pushed the envelope as far as they could go. And the reason the second is seen as kind of the, like the other movies are seen as a letdown is because... The matri the original Matrix pushed special effects so far forward that by the time the other ones came, everyone was like, wait, what? Oh, it, 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 there's nothing new. So, out of curiosity, and there is no wrong answer to this, would you say that the other two Matrix single sequels were unnecessary? Considering I've only seen the second one, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've never even seen the third and or the fourth one. I mean, they were okay. I'm not going to poo-poo them, but they were unnecessary sequels. They were, yeah, yeah. It, it was, and and don't get me wrong. I am a slut 
for continuation of stories. Ninety nine percent of the time, there is is no movie, book, whatever that I don't want more of. That was one of those few times where I was like, mm, maybe we could have just let this go. Yeah. The other movie I was worried about, again, Blade Runner is sacred. Yeah, well, yeah. We, we, we've talked about the 2049. It was the sequel we didn't know we needed until we saw it. But it was done so well that mm-hmm. it was like, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of those rare exceptions where I walked out of them. I walked in expecting the worst and came out thinking, wow, that was really damn cool. That was handled respectfully and done well. Mm-hmm. But, um... Yeah, that that'd be where I would say. I, I I can I'm not sure if I if I would want to see the Matrix again like that, but I could see where you're coming from. I have respect for your opinion on that. Yeah. So um, I guess let's well let's talk about the Oscars. So um, Dune won an award at the Oscars. Dune yes, won an Academy did. Award for sound design, and uh, because of all the crap that happened, it kind of got blown to the wayside. And me and you are both audio nerds. Well, okay. So. Well, here's the other thing. Um, one of the reasons, okay, first off, we're going to start right away. I fucking hate the Oscars. Uh, I have not, the Oscars to me haven't been relevant in decades. Exactly. Um, I remember distinctly the last Oscars I watched and it was the la. it was, uh, the year the two towers came out and it was the two towers won. So there's the the gold ring. I think it's like 12, 13, or 14 Oscars, which is the most any movie's won. It started with, um, oh, it's not the Ten Commandments, uh, Ben-Hur, one of those big epics. And nobody's ever won more Oscars than that. And and the, the Oscars have kind of made that, like, nobody's going to win that many Oscars. Um, to the point where other movies have hit that number, nobody's ever gone over it. So, the the uh, Return of the King, that was it, it was the Return of the King. So the Return of the King gets there, it wins every Oscar it's nominated for, which is all the technical Oscars. Except for Best Cinematography, <laughs> which is The Fellowship of the Rings and The Two Towers, both won best cinematography. They were all and er, they were all shot at the same time by the same person. The only reason they didn't win best cinematography is because that would have put them over the magic number. And they didn't they didn't win any awards for acting. They didn't win like it, it, it was basically just and and arguably I will still say The Return of the King is the the weakest of the three movies. You know, though, and to it, I really don't care because those 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 three movies are like the original Star Wars trilogy. Though all three of those movies, especially for people like us, you know, we're we're born we're died in the wool geeks. Nerds. Right, right. We're here. We're talking about this. So even if even if it didn't win an Academy Award of any kind, it, I could care less. Those movies were exactly they're, exactly. they're gold. Well, and know? it's like uh, a few years ago they were talking about, um, oh, we're going to have a category for like best popular movie, which was basically an excuse to, <sighs> okay. okay, well, these Marvel movies and these Star Wars movies are making ridiculous sums of money. So we need to get that crowd interested in the Oscars because let's face it, the Oscars. Yeah, but this cr- our crowd doesn't care about the Oscars. Well, yes, yeah, <laughs> because the the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences is a bunch of old white dudes circle jerking themselves about they are the ones who choose what is cinema, like what is cinema as yeah, an art so form. We don't care anyway. Yeah. So what's the point? So, and and it's um. Then a few years ago, they took a bunch of the technical Oscars and they're like, well, we're not going to show those on TV anymore. We're going to hand them out at a separate ceremony. And well, most people don't care about them. That's why. Well, we, I mean, we do, yeah. but you know, um, and then this year they announced that now they're adding to that award show that isn't televised best short film, best animated short film. Uh, best cinematography. So basically everything, even best score, basically everything that isn't an acting Oscar is now going to be in this other presentation that you don't see. 
and the actual Academy Awards are literally just going to be actors. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a three-hour show of giving out 10 awards for acting. So people just blowing each other for the most part. Exactly. Yeah. And then on top of that, then there's this goddamn bullshit about Will Smith. It's like... Yeah, I don't, I don't even want to talk about that. I could care less about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I really don't. Even when it happened, it, it was it was funny for a couple of minutes at the time, but within 24 hours, I was done with it and didn't even care. The only thing that I'll say about it, because there was like, is it real? It was fake. It was blah, blah. Now there's people trying to make it into a racial thing. The only thing that I'll say about it is the fact that Chris Rock was the better man and, 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 you know, and, and didn't file any charges or whatever and has not, that I know of, made any kind of a big deal about it whatsoever. And, you know, it was like, all right, he was the one that got got hit, you know? Yeah. And he, I mean, he, you could tell he was embarrassed by it and, you know, all that stuff. And he just powered through and kept on going. And in his mind, it's like, all right, start over with. And he, he took the higher ground and, and him doing it made him, in my opinion, the better person. Yeah. And that's, that, okay, okay, it's done. You know, whatever, moving on, you know. Right. So. But what we wanted to talk about is the Dune Oscar. Yes. Um, well, me and you are sound nerds. Oh, yeah, totally. And even before I found out that they had gotten the Oscar for it, the I love sound design because I used to do a lot of techno music and, you know, I've been doing my podcast for a long time. And so sound design is one of those one of those things in movies that is literal fucking magic. It is like just fucking magic. Mm -hmm. um, these people and, and the people who do sound design are, are wizards. Um, they will take sounds you know and turn them into the movies. Mm -hmm. Um and and beyond just foley effects. Like we've all like we've all seen those videos like showing uh people punching sides of meat as yeah, foley exactly. artists. Yeah, like, like Star like, Wars. Like, let's let's hit this thing and make a laser sound, you know. So yeah. so what started this was in fact Star Wars. So uh I forget his name. The guy who did the sound design for Star Wars um, the first at the first thing he did for sound design was George Lucas came to him and said, "I need to know what Chewbacca sounds like. Before I can write Chewbacca as a character, I have to know what his voice sounds like." So um, the guy who did the sound design he went out and there was this bear at the San Diego or Los Angeles Zoo. I want to say San Diego. And every time you showed this bear a piece of bread, it made these really weird sounds. So he went there and recorded this bear and added, like, dogs and a few other things and then made the voice of Chewbacca. And then he spent three months going around L.A. and just recording sounds. And mixing those together is that how we got the sounds of Star Wars. Uh, the laser blast sound was him taking a wrench and hitting high tension electric wires. Um, the sound of the the sound of the Tie Fighters going by is the trumpet of an elephant with the sound of a car on the freeway. Mm -hmm. um, things like that, like even going to the new uh, the new sequel trilogy, uh, the sound of like. That, that pulsing sound of Kylo Ren's force power is the sound designer's cat purring. They did that in Dune. One of the ornithopter sounds that they used to make the ornithopter, they took the fluttering of a beetle's wings. They held a beetle and they taped it. They, they, sound, they recorded the wings fluttering mm -hmm. because the ornithopters in Dune have the fluttering wings right. like a beetle does. They Which took a cat purring um, and a couple of other sounds, and they put them all together, but they slightly changed the octaves of them to make them fit in the same pitch. Which I got, I, my absolute favorite thing about the new mo Dune movie is the ornithopters. Like, just they are, s the way they move, mm -hmm. the way they look, like the fluttering is so beautiful. That's my favorite thing of the new Dune movies. And then they took the desert, and to, when people are walking on the desert, they actually took sand and put Rice Krispies into the sand and have people walk on that. And the reason why is they wanted people to, it puts in the back of your mind the presence of the spice being in the sand. Ooh. So when they're walking on the crunchy sound is the sound is supposed to be the, the spice being crushed down into the sand itself. So. <clears throat> yeah, like, like there is the same attention to like, and like I said, it's wizardry. It's, yeah. 
these people are thinking about things on a level to just turn it into take those sounds mix them together and you're like wow that's that's a cool sci-fi sound um when george lucas made star wars he was very adamant that he wanted everything to be natural sound he did not want it any electronic synthesization because he wanted those sounds to like filter through your brain and sound somewhat familiar but you couldn't place it so like that's the way they did dune that's mm -hmm. specifically why in the <clears throat> in the part where they're using the voice um they actually took they wanted they, they specifically said they wanted everything in the movie to sound natural they didn't want it to sound synthetic they want it to be based on sounds that are in nature. So when they did the voice effect, one of the things that they found is that there was a, one of the, the sound engineer was talking about how he used to listen to a lot of old like uh, reggae and dubstep and stuff. And there was a producer that used to be um, really into this kind of stuff. And what they did is they found that he would create this really low buzz hum. So what they did is they took this bass noise and they put it in one side of a room coming out of a speaker then they put the microphone on the other side of the room and they taped it and the buzz the sound coming out would make certain things in the room rattle like the chair move and stuff like that oh, yeah, so they yeah, wanted yeah. to capture all of that and put that in into the sound and then at that point they recorded different people's voices at different pitches and they kind of like put them into the same octave range so when you hear somebody say something there's that low resonance bass in the background overlap with different vo voices all coming out at the same time well it's um in LA, I want to say it's Tower Records or one of those, one of the big like 70, like even earlier than that, but one of the big recording studios in LA famously had these in recording. One of the effects they use is reverb, mm -hmm. where it makes your voice sound like it's reverberating. Yeah. Well, before electronic synthesizers, the way you did that was underground under these studios they had these massive echo chambers and the only thing that was in these chambers were speakers and a microphone and they were cement rooms and the like you would send the audio through down to that speaker and then that microphone would feed it back into the board and that's how you got reverb mm -hmm. and famously even into the electronics era some artists like just insisted that they had to record in those old studios to get that analog sound of the reverb. Mm -hmm. There's this box. There's I used to I used to hang a lot when I was younger in recording studios, um, and that's how I learned to do audio and stuff. I just had a bunch of people of friends that happened to work in them because I was very in, when I was younger I was very involved in a lot of Detroit techno music and stuff before it became really big. One of the studios that I was in, I can't remember which one is off the top of my head now. They had this big metal box. And it had different chambers inside the box, and you would they would have the they would have, Aretha Franklin actually sang through this particular one that I'm thinking of, so they would have the microphone set up at the other end of it, and they would have her singing in the microphone here and the microphone at the other end of it, so her voice would bounce around inside this big metal right, box, right, it was right, right. massive, with different chambers in it, and that was how they created the reverb for her voice. So they would do a dry one, and then they would have the mixed one at the other end, and they would overlap the two together. And the trick was finding getting the frequencies to match because her voice would change frequency as it's bouncing around inside this box. Yeah, they, um, another another man. I learned so much neat facts watching TikTok. I just love it. But um, you know, people rip on TikTok, but there's a lot of cool stuff out there if you know what you're into. Yeah, you I know? I was watching one, and it was talking about um, sound design and the. Uh, the 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 discovery of um it's not reverb oh drum delay i think mm -hmm. uh or drum modulation and it was talking about like in the this the 70s like when you would hear drum beats in in recorded sound the drums were always very clean and very crisp and then in the 80s phil collins was in the recording studio and he heard or he was playing the drums and they sent the drums audio into the board and then it was he was hearing the sound of the drums through the monitors in the studio or excuse me in the recording booth over the microphone they would use to talk back and the drum sounded different it sounded like this very muddy kind of like Doo -doo, doo -doo. Mm -hmm. and he just he was like oh my god that's that's amazing and the whole reason he wrote in the air tonight was because he discovered that drum noise, and he wrote that song to feature that like do 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 yes, like 
the Roto Toms. Exactly. And if you and what I love about that song is the whole song is him singing about like like I can feel it. I can feel it coming in the air and you're waiting for it and you're waiting for it. It's building up and then you hear that drum beat and it's just like yeah. <laughs> Like the whole song is like him singing about waiting for this the beat to drop, and then the beat drops, and like everybody loses their you shit. You really don't want to have this conversation with me because my favorite band in the world is Tool, and Danny Carey from Tool, with the amount of crazy sound design that he uses in his drums, it's, it, it, it yeah, this is that and Neil Peart from Rush are my oh. two favorite um, drummers, and the things that they do to push their craft. How dare you fail to recognize my greatest accomplishment to date? What, you finally nailed YYZ? It's Zed, and no, Neil Peart stands alone. (laughs) We could go on for hours talking about this stuff. Oh, yeah, it's... But yeah, like, I... Props to the people who did the sound design Mm. for Zune. Props to the people who did the prop design for Dune. Like, Like, it has that... It it captures that feel of the same thing the original Star Wars had mm-hmm. the anarchist uh, the anachronistic future the future where things feel old and like everything because the the whole mythology of Dune is they do not have thinking machines they don't have they never evolved beyond that computer because of the 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 rise of the thinking machines so all the technology of dune is analog yeah it's 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 anachronistic like um you know what that reminds me of something that i i I, way back when we were talking about dune before you brought something up and i wasn't sure about it at the time and when i went back i rewatched it when i saw it we were talking about how the guild navigators how they fold space yes and i said well I, i didn't like how they did what they did or whatever and you said well because of how it worked and after I went back and rewatched it, I re- I, you were right. The ships that they fold space with, it's a tube. That it's a giant. The ship yeah. that they use in this version do. So the ship comes in one end of the tube in one universe and comes out the other side of the universe and the other side of the tube. So they actually fold space through those giant tube-like spaceships. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the original story, which was, I don't mind that they changed it because it's a neat. It was cost cutting and it still looked cool because that movie had such a fantastic budget. You got to do what you can. And uh, you were right. You said something. I don't remember what you said at the time, but you said something like, I think the spaceship itself. Yeah, because it's like they... if you in the scene where they show the Atreides dropships coming in. Yeah. The, 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 in Dune, even in the David Lynch Dune and the Sci-Fi Channel Dune, the Navigator ships are always this tube. Mm-hmm. But in the Villanova Dune, if you look at that scene, you can see into the ship. Exactly. And it looks like it's a different, a different star system. Well, when they showed it outside of Arrakis... You could see through the other side of the ship, and you could see the planet Dune, and you could see the planet Arrakis in the background, and the small opening of the ships are all coming out of it. As, as no, no, it's Caladan. Our... Caladan, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Caladan. And I was like, son of a bitch, he was right. Okay. <laughs> so I'll go on record and say, yes, you were right. But I, I, at the time, I could, that's one thing I, I'm like, well, they didn't, they didn't really show them folding space or whatever. It, it that's does, how they did it. It does happen once in a while. I am right every once in a while. So I was, it was... I, I could go back and rewatch that movie again. You know, oh, I've already I, I know. watched it twice. You know, uh, I saw it with you, then I watched it again at home, and I'm ready to watch it again. <laughs> you know, I, I'm... we interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Greetings, OND listeners. This is John Patrick, the Master Control Program from the Edit Suite. What follows is a five minute sidetrack of a conversation that leads to a point that you probably weren't expecting. So please just bear with us on this journey. Actually, okay, so I realized the other day I haven't watched Lord of the Rings in probably a decade. So um, in my list of things I need to rewatch, I need to do a Lord of the Rings rewatch. I, I um, because and what got me thinking about it was um, so it's weird because I was thinking this myself. That's yeah. why I'm doing the whole um. <laughs> uh, so I got a new 3D printer. Um, my other 3D printers are resin SLA 3D printers. And I wanted to get a uh, FDM 3D printer, which is the kind that uses the filament spools, mm-hmm. um, which is, oh my God, like I, th- I thought because I like, I'd been using the resin printers and I got really good at it. And it, it was like, oh man, this is so much, so easy. I was so worried about it. Then I got an FDM printer and it's just like, oh, 
the universe hates me because like it is it is a very very steep learning curve like trying to go up a like climb up a roller coaster first hill from the drop side that is the learning curve of an fdm printer i love 3d printers yeah um, i cannot wait to own one because now like i don't know if we've ever talked about this before but when me and you because i'm older than you um I, when I was growing up, it was like if you wanted a miniature, it was like man, you had to hope you, the gaming store you have has go to has the miniature. They were really expensive and stuff. And now with the advent of three D printers, it's a great time to be a gamer because if you need terrain, that for sci fi terrain, you just print it. You need yeah. a miniature, you just print it. Gone are the days of well, I can't play this game because I don't have a miniature. I got to go to the gaming shop and which are usually on the other side of town and stuff. Now with the advent of three D printers. You can do, you, you can create your own games if you wanted to, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many things that you can do now, you know, which much to the dismay of companies like Games Workshop and stuff like that, you know, it's just now, now we're at a time where it's like, when, when you're a tabletop gamer or you're a role playing gamer and stuff, miniatures and terrain and all these things are such an important factor in the game. And for years, these companies kind of had you by the balls. Not so much now. Now you go out, like, well, how much you think you got on your setup? Maybe, what, $1,000 altogether with all your printers? Oh, okay. So uh, the first 3D printer I bought was uh, a any cubic Photon Mono. and Which it, I want to buy off you. <laughs> it was like $300. Yeah. And that's my workhorse 3D printer. I still yeah. do the vast majority of all my printing with that. Uh, but I was running up into some stuff that was too big for that. So I got the Photon Mono X. The bigger one. Yeah, that was about $500. I'm looking at your setup right here as we yeah. discuss this. It's over, um, to our, it's over to my left. And uh, that that was great. It, like, for doing the bigger parts I needed to do, it did it perfectly. See, I thought you'd be set with that. And then I come down in the basement, and you've got the filament printer. So, and I'm like, so the whoa. F <laughs> yeah, the FDM printer is there's some things I specifically wanted to print, and you just can't do with resin. Um, doing full cosplay helmets. You cannot do with resin. Um, so I was looking at 3D printers. I found one that would print. The size of the printable area was big enough that I could do a helmet in one spot. So what you're saying without saying it, and you're going to say it now, is you bought that printer to make a Mandalorian helmet, didn't Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, 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 no. 100%, I will eventually make a Mandalorian helmet. Um, and, but like that was $600 and then wow. I test printed and it, 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 I was having problems and then come to find out, uh, I talked to some friends, my 3d printing pre friends and they're like, Oh, Oh yeah. Well, you're really going to want a glass bed instead of the bed they give you. And that's going to help you make better prints. Okay. So I did that. So I bought the glass bed, another $50 and then I was having problems and the the like my prints would get to a certain height and then they'd start failing and then come to find out it's like oh well the the z axis the the axis that goes up well it's two screws two long screws and as they turn it lifts this gantry up but the problem is they're not always straight so you need these torsion screws so that was another 20 dollars worth of upgrades and i got one good print and i was like yes it's like four bad prints, but now I got this one good print. Then I did, and I'm like, all right, now I'm ready to do a big, long, it's going to run for a day print. And it got about halfway in, and it warped. And I, or no, it, it, like, the top looked like it slid a quarter of an inch. And I looked, and the nuts that hold the, bo the bed and you use to level it had all fallen out. So I go back on the forums and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, th those those nuts are crap. You're going to want better springs that hold those oh in. Oh, my God. <laughs> and, and, here, you, and aluminum. They're like, these will hold in place better. I was like, fuck. And another $25 worth of... So, like, in addition to the 600 bucks I was in for the printer, I'm also now into $100 worth of upgrades for the printer. Um, and even then, there's more stuff I could do to upgrade it. And... Now I've completely forgotten what I was talking about when we first went on this tangent, <laughs> but it leads me into another thing I wanted to talk about because uh, on the subject of Mandalorian helmets, like one of the reasons is one of the events that I have wanted to go to for years 
is finally back after COVID, and I will finally be able to go. And it's called Space Dive. Okay, what is I, this is new to me. What is Space Dive? So, on the weekend, usually either before or after May the 4th, at the Tangent Art Gallery in Detroit, they run this live interactive event called Space Dive. And they turn the art gallery into the Moss Eisley Cantina. And they have a bar area. How they, much? $30. And this is what date? Um, so there's three days they're running it. I have, I'm going on May the 6th. Um, but, but hold on because there's more. (laughs) Oh, well, there's more. So like one of the rooms in the gallery is the cantina. Then there's like an outdoor area. Then there's like, they set up like an actual, like one to one scale ships. So there's like a landing area. The requirement is you have to come in costume. Yeah, I'm not going to have a costume, though. Well. So, yeah. Um, well, I mean, you don't have to have an A-grade level costume. Like, you just have to have something that has a cost. Or, like, it, you've got to be somebody else. You've got to be a, You've got to fit into the Star Wars universe. Yeah. This is where I was going with it. I think. I'm not exactly sure. But talking about, like, the, the anachronistic future... And, like, the, the people who do the visual effects design. So now... Are you sure you don't use weed? Could I buy some pot from you? No. I, <laughs> I'm this weird normally. I, like, I'm starting, I'm starting to believe that, you know, I may have a little adult ADHD with a touch of autistic spectrum. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, like yeah. yeah, a little bit on the autism spectrum. Yeah. So I'm going this year. Usually, Space Dive always falls on the same weekend as PenguinCon. And this year, PenguinCon's happening earlier, so I can finally go to Space Dive. Um, and a bunch of my, my nerdy friends were all going. Uh, but they all have Jedi and Star Wars cos- or they already have costumes and lightsabers and all that. I don't. So I am, like, looking at my brand new 3D printer, and, and I went on Amazon, and I'm starting to put together a costume. Because I don't want to go as a Jedi. Are you going as the Mandalorian or a Mandalorian? Neither. I'm not going to have a whole, whole uh, armor printed. Mm-hmm. But what I am doing is, so I want to go as kind of like a, a smuggler character. I have boots, like just my, my regular work boots, but they're those like slip-on kind. So they don't have laces. So it looks kind of like sci-fi-ish. I should go as Porkins. <laughs> Way to ruin the moment, Porkins. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I'm just going to wear jeans. Just, just jeans, because, you know, maybe they got jeans in the Star Wars universe. Um, I found an old dress shirt that doesn't have, like, a, a fold-over tie collar. It's just a straight-laced collar that buttons in front. And I'm going to order a vest, like, just kind of like one of those uh, outdoor vests. And then I found a file for, like, like Mandalorian armor shoulder pads. And I'm going to take the shoulder pads and they have little like loop points where you can tie them on and attach them over the shoulder. So it looks like it's, you know, sci-fi-ish. It's like that, that, that slightly armored look. Um, and then I found like the files to uh, print uh, Jen Erso's blaster from, the man, er, from uh, Rogue One, mm-hmm. which is a bunch of Greeblies glued onto an airsoft uh, Luger. Which I priced out the Luger, and man, those things are expensive. So I'm just 3D printing the Luger parts. Yeah, but but it's the whole this whole experience. Like you go to this, you go to this art gallery, and you walk in, and you don't walk into the gallery. You walk into Star Wars. Everybody's in costume. Um, there's Star Wars themed cocktails. Uh, there's a Star Wars themed burlesque show. I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's just like a whole night where you just kind of get to live in the Star Wars universe. This brings two things to mind. Number one, um, this is quick. Um, I am going to be at Disney World on Halloween, which I'm gonna. Ge- that's one of one of my dreams my whole life. The second thing is the most important thing that I'm looking forward to is I'm finally gonna go to Star Wars World down there. Um, like and, you say that like you have another choice. Yeah, I, I, I have to go. I, 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 it's like that is 
when when it was like when it was talked about okay we're gonna go to disney world um i've always wanted to go there during halloween my wife has never had interest in that she always wanted to go at christmas time i'm not really interested in going at christmas time we come to find out that the main park the magic kingdom itself halloween night as soon as the park closes they immediately convert the main park into christmas so my brain went ding we can have the best of both worlds so we're we we've actually got it booked, which is amazing. And the other thing is that we don't like crowds, but I'm going to suck it up for oh, this. Oh my god! I, I'm sorry. I'm just picturing like the scene in the Nightmare Before Christmas where they do the Halloween, and then it's like, okay, 365 days till Halloween next year. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. So in my mind, a I'm going to be there at Halloween um, in the Magic Kingdom, but I'm also going to be down there to go to the Star Wars park during halloween so you just know there's going to be a million people walking around in star wars cosplay okay so here's the thing disney will not let you dress in full character this this is a so i learned this they're like you can't go to the magic kingdom dressed as a disney princess okay um so the Disney fandom has developed this whole kind of like specialized cosplay for Disney where it's like wearing outfits that evoke the image of the Disney princesses but are not full Disney princess costumes. I have seen people, this is a while ago though, it's been about 10 years since I've been to the park. There's a special word for it and I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Because I've seen people walking around in Sith co cosplay. Now... Star Wars land, they will let you get away with a little bit more. Um, but the idea is they don't want you looking so much like a character. That you people that, think you are Yeah, a that people confuse you with. Because, like, people who go to the Star Wars-themed hotel yeah. want to go in character. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they'll let you get away with it a little bit more in Star Wars land, but they won't wet, let you wear face masks. They won't let you wear, ma like, you can't go in uh, Darth Sith Zabrak, like, makeup. See, I've seen people in that before, but that was ten years ago. Yeah. I've seen people walking around, and like, there is, there is in the Star Wars Legacy comic books, there is a uh, Darth Talon, which is a female Zabrak, who's red and black with uh, the paint all over. And last time I was there, there was a Darth Talon uh, chick walking around with her lightsabers and stuff like that. But oh, that and was they, in... They... They will absolutely not let you walk around with a lightsaber. She had it was it like it was it was one of the ones that you, you it was you could you could it was one of the ones that you yeah, build at it, the yeah, Star yeah, Wars. If you ride. buy the ones there, yeah. you can, but you cannot bring in your own. They're like super crazy. Yeah, it was one of the ones that you put together. At the, well, now now the Star Wars land is there, but at the time they only had the Star Tours there, and you could go in there and you could build your own lightsaber. And there was a couple of plot spots all over Disney where you could build your own lightsabers. Like there was one in downtown Disney and now Disney Springs where you could because I built one. I built my own lightsaber, of course. Um, but that was back then. Now that the park's open, they, they've probably, yeah, you're probably right. They've probably changed it because I could see why. I could totally see why somebody coming in there dressed as a, like a character like that would be shot down or whatever. Can, can we talk about another thing? That One I, more thing. All right. One more thing. Um, I believe it is Dragon Con. Did you ever see, they did this cosplay parade. Oh, they do it every year for Dragon Con. But... It was only the character from Empire Strikes Back that's running down the hallway holding the ice cream maker, which oh, is yeah, supposed yeah, to be a demo. There is a whole group of people who cosplay them, but the parade is always part of Dragon Con. Like, they always do a cosplay parade through downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like whole groups of people. There just happened to be within the parade a whole group of people cosplaying him. Because they showed him just coming down the hallway, coming out of the hallway. It was just the same people oh, dressed yeah, as yeah, the yeah, same yeah, character. Yeah. I mean, that that's just normal Dragon Con. But, like, Dragon Con does a cosplay parade. The 501st shows up in literal Legion strength. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, there's another group of cosplayers who are, like, my favorite cross kind of, like, fusion cosplay. They're the Riders of Brohan. So it's all a bunch of, like, dudes with frosted tips, polo shirts, <laughs> popped collars, sunglasses, and, yeah, they're the Briders of Brohan. Oh, my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, but, but anyways, you were going to say before so, I cut you off. So um, one of my favorite kind of ancillary Star Wars fandoms is the idea of people who make their own lightsabers... But the whole idea of making your own lightsaber 
is your lightsaber is personal to you. So it's making your own lightsaber, but doing it in a way that it evokes your personal story. Mm -hmm. So like... I'd be about that. So like you, because you're a... Like you, you've been podcasting for so long, uh, but you're also a motorcycle guy. So you would maybe find found parts of an old motorcycle, and that would be the handle for your lightsaber. Um, part of your lightsaber might be part of a an XLR cord from a microphone to show that that's part of what you do. But like, I love looking on like reddit and all these and even on on tiktok and seeing people who have made their own personal lightsabers but that are like part of their person and like that's just this such a cool thing of the star wars fandom i don't know if i would take motorcycle parts or stuff like that but i've always been i've always been partial i've seen a few things like this where people have made like like a wooden kind of a, a collaboration of a wooden and metal hilt you know, I, w- I would do something like that. Yeah, because... So, you know... Uh, um, in very much in the Star Wars tradition, lightsabers are made from found objects. Yeah. Like, you you gather the pieces of the lightsaber. In fact, I believe in one of the books, one of the Jedis had a lightsaber that was built from the handle off a swoop bike. Mm-hmm. Or, or I love seeing... So, like, people who do cross-universe lightsabers, mm-hmm. like, there is a whole deeply devoted fandom who make uh just fucking gorgeous lord of the rings lightsabers like if you ever want to see some of the most beautiful lightsabers just google lord of the rings lightsabers and there we have it folks we've reached the point okay now now i remember where this whole giant tangent started it started with us talking about lord of the rings and what made me realize that I needed... This show needs a flow chart. <laughs> it really does sometimes. So what made me realize I needed to do a Lord of the Rings rewatch was I was a pl- I was um, joining a Facebook group for people who swap STL files for 3D printed armor. Mm-hmm. And that got us talking about the Mandalorian helmet and me talking about my new 3D printer. But one of the questions they ask you is, what is your favorite cinema or what is your favorite media suit of armor? Hmm. Ah, the first thing that comes to mind is Iron Man mm-hmm. because it's so iconic and it, it, you know, just the way it flows and stuff. Even the original Mark one armor from the original Iron Man movie was still oh, yeah, pretty yeah. cool. Outside of that, I would have to think a little bit about what my favorite suit of armor would be. Um, Sauron from Lord of the Rings is in there. Just be, I, I'm not really sure why that one pops into my head. Um, what else would there be? Um, ma, 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 ma. Ah, right, those are the two that come to mind immediately off the top of my head without having to put too much thought into it. Without even thinking about it, mine is Theoden's armor from the Two Towers. Like the first time I ever saw Theoden's armor and his sword, I like it's just incredible i was gobsmacked by it like the the process they use is they made the leather armor and then they found these old texts about people who would cut leather and glue the leather to the armor to create designs over it Mm -hmm. so he has this like metal plate armor but there's these leather panels over it with the iconography of horses and all that i'd have to see it again and then his sword herigrim like the hilt of the sword is the two horse heads converging and it's that thick Viking style sword and just, Oh my God, without a doubt, Theoden's armor of all armor, the star Wars armor, the Mandal like a God, I love me some Mandalorian armor. It's all a second to Theoden's armor. Um, what I like about Mandalorian armor is each set of Mandalorian armor is a little bit different because they yeah. make them themselves. Yeah, and, that, and that's and, that would be one of the things that would be one of the projects I would love to tackle is making, like I said, the the, the personalized lightsaber, yeah. but also making the personalized Mandalorian helmet or the per, personalized Mandalorian armor. And what's cool is that opens up the realm for so much cross cosplay because you see some really funny and cool oh, oh, oh. suits of Mandalorian armor out there. There, there is, uh, it just started showing up. Somebody made a set of armor and he is the man DeLorean. 
and it's oh yeah yeah, yeah I've his, seen that one. Yeah, his helmet yeah. has the, the gull doors. Wing, yeah. yeah, his hel- it's helmet awesome. has the gull wing doors yeah. of the DeLorean. Like on his belt, he's got a flex capacitor, and there's this picture of him getting his picture taken with Christopher Lloyd. Yeah, it, like, have you seen the Disney Princess Mandalorian armor? Sets? I've seen some of those. I've Hello seen Kitty. Yeah, yeah, the Hello Kitty. Yeah. Um, in this same vein is uh, the Master Chef. People who dress up as Master Chief, but they've got a chef's hat and they've got like <laughs> cooking utensils. Um, so uh, what's going on in my life, which is why we've had a little bit of a hiatus, is um, uh, last week my son broke his leg. I had intended to try and record last week to get an episode in the can and my son broke his leg. Uh, so he he's in good spirits, but he gets to do his fa- two favorite things of sit on the tow- couch and watch TV. And so it forced me to watch the new Space Jam movie. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. It is. Oh, it's bad. It is so bad. But it introduces this idea of, like, that all the Warner Brother movies exist in the same universe. And they're, like, different worlds in the same universe. So, like... It, like it crosses the Looney Tunes with the Matrix, it crosses you know the what? Looney Tunes with like Harry Potter and the DC. Space Jam is the Matrix. Yeah, well, <laughs> and and especially this one because they're drawn into this computer program and and oh it's bad yeah. oh yeah it's bad. But even like Rick, even Rick and Morty show up. Like there is a Rick and Morty cameo. Uh, they're they're gathering up all the tunes and you all know... the tunes have like gone to the different worlds. So like. Uh, Daffy Duck is on the DC Universe world. Uh, Granny from like Sylvester and Tweety is That's like kind of the new playing... zeitgeist. Yeah. It's, it's the multiverse. Right. Uh, Granny's in the Matrix as um, uh, uh, Neo's girlfriend, Trinity. Um, like, but they, So they've got almost the whole Toon Squad together, and then Rick and Morty show up, and they basically just drop the Tasmanian devil, and they're like, fuck it, it's your problem now. So yeah, space the new Space Jam. Like, this is how bad the new Space Jam is. So it's LeBron James instead of Michael Jordan. And like for the first half hour of the movie, nobody refers to him as LeBron James. They all refer to him as King James. Okay. And, and like at first I'm like, uh, is, is this a thing? Like, is that his ego that that's, that's what he has people call him? Is this him? a biblical thing? Or... Yeah. Like, um, or is this like a, is this like a contract thing where the NBA is like, you can't call him LeBron James. Like when Hulk Hogan started doing movies and he couldn't say Hulk Hogan, he had to be Terry Hogan. It's the same thing with, um, Dwayne, the rock Johnson. Yeah. He can't say he's the rock. It's Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. But I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Um, so, Rojin, it's good to have you back on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, I've got um, a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, so. <laughs> I, I, I know you. I know you've been on a bit of a, a sabbatical. Um, as far as my show, I'm I'm kind of starting to get the itch to want to go back to it, but I don't know. I mean, honestly, I've been podcasting for 13 years now, and it's just like I don't know if I want to go back to it or not. To be honest with you. Um, I don't know. We'll see. You know, I've, I've, things are starting to stabilize and, and life is beginning to ter- return somewhat to normal because for a while it was crazy. But uh, yeah, so that's that is a small inkling of everything that's been going on with me. Well, we're glad to have you back and hopefully we'll see you for some more uh, episodes here in the Nerd Cave. But until then, I'm John Packer, the Master Control Program. And this is Roro. <laughs> End of line. Over? Did you say over? Nothing is over until we decide it is! Was it over when the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor? Hell no! German? Forget it, he's rolling. And it ain't over now! So, what's the plan? Take car, go to Mum's, kill Phil, sorry, grab Liz, go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. Might as well write them off. Let's close up the bridge. Let's get out of here. Close it up. Lights out. Where are you headed, cowboy? Nowhere special. Nowhere special. I always wanted to go there. We're going streaking!